Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and hello to those of you in the future who are watching this recording. <laughs> I am really excited for this laser uh, Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. Of course, it's not evening everywhere, but it will be. Uh, these lasers have started from one or two uh, by Pierre Luigi Capucci, who uh, formed this, um, oh, it's almost 10 years ago now, maybe more. Uh, now there's about 40 locations around the world where artists and scientists come together in informal settings. And now we've all moved online, which makes it actually in some ways great because we can have participants from all over. And that's exactly what's going on today. So we are featuring Bill Fontana, who's coming to us from San Francisco. He is the UCLA Art Science resident artist in virtual residence for a new program we're starting called Atmosphere of Sound. And this residency is exploring sound and frequencies, acoustics related to ecology and healing in particular. So I took the liberty to collect a number of people who I think Bill would enjoy talking to and all of us will enjoy listening to. Uh, I certainly admire everybody sitting around here. Uh, we have Carlo Ventura uh, visiting us from Bologna, from Italy. And George Kwasha is here from New York, upstate. Anna Naher comes to us from Slovakia. And Nina is here next door to me in Los Angeles. So welcome everybody. And I just want to give us a little bit of an idea of how this goes. Uh, everybody here will give you a short introduction of who they are and what they're thinking right now in relation to our subject matter. And then we start having a discussion and we also take questions from the audience. So with that, I hand the Zoom floor to Bill Fontana to give us a little five minute or more, a couple of minutes more maybe intro into what he's doing. Uh, we've had quite a few interactions with Bill. He does these amazing um, uh, daily meditations at the San Francisco Bay Bridge uh, dealing with the quarantine. And we've had the pleasure to, uh, the listening pleasure also, he visited my class called Vibrations Matters. So he's been quite generous with his time. Thank you, Bill, for being so generous and so wonderful to work with. Welcome. Well, thank you for welcoming me to this wonderful group of people and this wonderful sense, sense of community in this strange uh, moment where we're sort of experiencing isolation. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just really nice to be uh, involved with this amazing community that you've uh, created. Um, I've got a, a video that I just edited uh, in the last couple of days, and I'm going to send you an email link to it, Victoria, later that maybe you can share with uh, all of these people. I have spent a lot of my time in San Francisco kind of uh, going to certain places that give me a certain kind of peace of mind. There are various places in San Francisco Bay near the Golden Gate Bridge, but also near, near, the, near, the, near the water coming into San Francisco from the, from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this uh, screenshot that is my background right now is from a uh, video series that I've uh, produced called Graf Graphic Waves. And uh, I go to certain spots very, very, very often in San Francisco, observing the kind of uh, kind of uh, choreography of these uh, of the wave patterns I see in certain in certain vantage points, and I make uh, sound recordings of these uh, situations, often with uh, accelerometers, kind of buried in the sand. I mean, where the waves are coming. And for those of you who may not know what an accelerometer is, it's a piezoelectric transducer that is used by structural engineers 
to measure the, the hidden, hidden world of vibration and everything that you can see. And uh, I've been uh, really fascinated by this as a, as a listening instrument and the idea that it's uh, in this uh, uh, kind of world that's uh, inside of everything. Uh, and, and one of the ideas about vi vibration that uh, accelerometers reveal to me is that uh, in a strange kind of way, everything seems connected by uh, vibration. Uh, this is most evident to me in situations like uh, I, I've been involved with slowly developing a very unusual project uh, in Paris. Right now it's a, it's a remote development because I'm not able to go to Paris. But um, I, uh, in the mid 1980s, lived in Japan and spent a lot of time in Kyoto and was um, very interested among other things in, um, in, in, in some of the Zen Buddhist temples I visited in Kyoto. And the idea of the sound of silence fascinated me. And there are these classic Zen meditations where you take a one of these bowl-shaped temple bells and you strike it. And if you really are meditating uh, on the sound of the bell as, as it's vibrating after you strike it, and you can uh, experience a loss of separation between your ego and the sound. And so that in a sense at this moment of focusing, you become the sound of the bell. You might have this sensation that the bell doesn't stop ringing. And so in, I had access to some of these uh, Buddhist temples in Kyoto and, and some other parts of Japan and I would go there with accelerometers and mount them on, the, on these bells and was amazed to discover that these bells uh, are, are basically listening devices and that they're constantly ringing secretly in response to just the ambient noise uh, on where these bells. And was amazed to discover that these bells uh, are, are basically I'm, I'm hearing a recording of myself. <laughs> um, and uh, so I've continued to, to explore this idea. Uh, in New York, I did a project about the, the bells of the Met Life Tower, uh, the original Met Life Tower, which no longer ring because that building is a, uh, is a luxury hotel now. Uh, in London, I've explored the post this idea with uh, Big Ben because the, the four clock bells of Big Ben are not ringing because they're doing uh, renovation works on the tower of Big Ben. But the project I am in the slow process of, of evolving in Paris is a bit of a, maybe kind of a crazy thing to be trying to do. But I was uh, really thinking about actually one of the acoustic and spiritual symbols of Paris. Notre Dame, which suffered this terrible catastrophic uh, fire uh, last year. And so the project I, I'm, I am slowly uh, trying to create is an installation that would involve creating a living uh, live streaming sound sculpture with the 10 silent bells of Notre Dame and to transmit this to uh, a, a number of installation sites, one of them possibly being Sancho Pompidou. So this is what I've been uh, sort of spending a lot of my energy uh, actually trying to navigate. And I wanted to share with you an amazing um, poem, which written, written by the German poet Reiner Maria Rilke that really kind of expresses the kind of uh, insight you know, into this kind of idea. The poem says, no longer for ears, sound which like a deeper ear hears us who only seem to be hearing, reversal of spaces, projection of innermost worlds into the open. And I think 
that poem really for me kind of represents uh, the kind of idea you know, that, that I'm thinking, thinking about with this. But it, it's really bizarre to be trying to, to get a project like this going remotely. You know, and, and all, all the people I have contact with in Paris are by Zoom. And um, I'm, I'm hoping in uh, early part of next year to go, be able to actually go to Paris and climb around in the bell tower so of Notre Dame and make some test recordings of this, of the, be the bells that aren't ringing and, and maybe take this to the next, next level. Thank you, Bill. I'm so happy you shared this with everybody else. Uh, it connects so much to everybody sitting here. So it'll be really great to have you part of the discussion. And uh, now we're going to hear from Dr. Carlo Ventura, who's coming to us from Bologna, the University of Bologna, actually, where he is professor in molecular biology and, and uh, we had the great pleasure of having Carlo's uh, lecture on cells and light and motion and his uh, collaborations with artists. And recently, uh, VidArt, the art science uh, um, center that he started with his partner in Bologna is our partner. So we're actually pulling him in more than he, <laughs> he expected, I think. But thank you so much for joining us. And I know it's a little bit late there, but I also know that you're a night bird, so welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, Victoria. So uh, yes, uh, we're working on, on stem cells. And uh, uh, what we usually do is uh, uh, harvesting vibrations from the cells. Uh, like mechanical vibrations. This is something we have been done with Jim Jenseski. We continue to do with the atomic force microscope, or we can use uh, hyperspectral imaging cameras to uh, detect uh, light fluctuations from the cells. And so uh, the, the idea was basically to uh, decipher uh, signatures of the healthy or non-healthy status of the cells or the stem cells and try to understand how we can give those signatures back to the cells to improve their function. In other words, if you imagine a stem cell, uh, so a stem cell is a cell capable of transforming itself in, uh, in any of the possible uh, uh, mature cells that will comprise the adult body. So we have tissue resident stem cells and we can harvest vibrations from these cells. And these patterns uh, will change based upon uh, the fact that the stem cell is becoming a cardiac cell, a neural cell, a bone cell, whatever. And we can send those signatures back to cells that are still in the really uh, non-mature form. They're still undifferentiated to, uh, to trigger their own differentiation. Uh, this is for us important because we can somehow uh, rely upon the diffusive features of this energy. So sound can, can move through the body. Light, especially in the near infrared domain, domain, can pass through the body. And we can reprogram the stem cells where they already are. They're resident in all the tissues of the human body. So from, from a strictly a scientific standpoint, uh, we may say that uh, uh, we can uh, basically uh, inform the stem cells in situ, where they already are, uh, just to boost uh, our uh, inherent ability for self healing. But uh, uh, today, I would like to uh, to discuss another issue. Uh, within the context of bidder science, we are working with artists, and one of them is uh, is a dear friend, is, is a brother to me, is Milford Graves. He is a legend in the, in the jazz music and in percussions. And we have been working together since the last eight, more than eight years, um, deciphering sounds coming from the human heart. And um, you can you can click on this movie, or you can do it and see. Okay, you see, every everything is is vibrating inside our cells. These are microtubuli. 
Okay. So it's uh, it's the style artwork, uh, and even the molecules. So the the next the next slide shows you. If we can go to the next. Uh, okay, so this is uh, an image of a peptide, so a signaling molecule. You see a spring, alpha helices, and turn in the alpha helices. So it's a vibrational actuator. And everything is resonating in our cells, it's creating information. So if we can go to the next one. Okay. Uh, this is the 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 event you don't need to play this it's just just uh, to show that uh, with Milford Grace in the 2016 we created this event in in Bologna and we call cell melodies and we had human stem cells on, on, the, on the stage of an inverted microscope equipped with uh, hyperspectral imaging and finally we we succeeded in, in demonstrating that human stem cells were first passively adapting to the rhythm of the musicians. But then uh, while Milford was keeping holding his phrasing, the cells were always adapting and they were creating their own rhythm in response to the performance of the artist. So the, the next one. Okay, the next. This shows you uh, Milford playing the sound that we recorded. And this is the uh, light fluctuation that has been recorded from the cells that were responding to the sound created by the artists. Now, uh, Milford, if we can go to the next one. Can move to the next. Okay, what we've been uh, discussing uh, yesterday, just with Milford, it was uh, uh, an event that lasted two hours at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, was uh, the wonderful work that Milford has done in uh, uh, sampling uh, the sound from the heart, just from a particular part of the contractile activity of the heart, the left ventricle. This is something that the human ear cannot perceive. It's below 10 Hertz. But he, he went through uh, uh, recordings and then to uh, what he did was basically able to, to have fractal frequencies of the sound of the human heart. So he rose the pitch he, he made auto similarity curves. So by comparing the log of the power, the sound, the log, the frequency of the sound, he came up with these frequencies that create a melody. So if we can go to the next one. Yeah. And you can hopefully click on this, uh, on this uh, audio file. I hope you can hear uh, this sound. Otherwise, I can probably. Uh... Uh, we don't hear it, but let's just go ahead and then we'll pull it up a little later in the discussion. Okay, it's it's fascinating that the sound of the heart is not what we would think. It's not ba boom ba boom. It's it's a melody, and uh, the next shows you that when we gave this melody to uh, our stem cells, this is what we got. Uh, we had a transformation of cells from the control here. You can see this panel here. These are neural cells that uh, are coming out from the undifferentiated state just because these cells were treated with the sound of the heart. 
here you see in this other panel here, you see a neurogenesis event. And here again, below here, you see uh, this, uh, this colored part. These are just cardiac myocytes that came out from uh, uh, the exposure to this sound. So basically the sound of the heart entails uh, a specific a message, a specific information that can tell to our stem cells to transform themselves into neural element or in cardiac element. This is really fascinating. When, when we scramble it with this sound uh, and make it disordered, none of this event took place anymore. So uh, within the, if we can go to the, to the next slide. Next. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. This is just a particular of the one that we saw before. We can go to the next. So there is a sort of healing heart within the sound of the heart. And this is really fascinating that an artist mm -hmm. was able to, to record this music and to to come up with a melody that everybody has inside us. Our heart has this possibility. And uh, within the, the sound of the human heartbeat, there is so much information that can reprogram our stem cells to um, some of the most complex uh, commitments like becoming neural cells or becoming heart cells. So uh, I will just conclude this with this quote by Asrat Inyad Khan, Sufi, musician, a healer, and a mystic. And, and uh, that's it. Uh, I'll leave for the discussion. Thank you, Carla, so much. You can see how all of this is connecting beautifully. So the next speaker is George Kwasha. And uh, I have him down as an artist philosopher, but he's also a poet and uh, all kinds of different mediums, uh, un impossible to categorize, which we love. So welcome, George, coming from upstate. Uh, Shala, there's no images, so you can not share. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, should I start with this uh, odd screen? Hmm. Hey, Chella. Can you uh, stop sharing? There, there we go. go. Sorry about that. So, um, you know, thanks for the hyphenated identity. <laughs> I, I, I have to have a, um, a special kind of sense of identity because of this, this, the sense of hyphenation and and I, I decided to write something out because um, my tendency toward what I used to call dislogo traction might keep us going a bit, a bit longer. So um, I, the one part of the hyphenated identity that you gave me, philosopher is the one that makes me mostly uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, um, what I do- because you are a philosopher at the bottom of it all. <laughs> Well, you know, I don't think there's a philosopher alive. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, what I'm going to basically say is that identity is what I, what I do. So it's what I call poesis, because I operate at the intersection of identities and, and at the intersection of mediums. So since I say that what we do is what we are, that's where I operate, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So I see myself mainly in this, this context of, of not accomplishment, but accomplishing a, a, an ongoing perspective within that, that set of identities, possibilities. So as this is by definition, never the same, your identity is always in flux. Existing categories obscure as much as they reveal what we are. In my, in my own view, our, our self-presentation is coterminous with a world of participation. Everything happens in a, in a frame and frames overlap. 
This requires new language, sometimes spontaneously, which can be a problem for science, which would prefer that um, things stay pretty much stably indicated. Uh, poesis left to its own devices is of course a wild card. And so communication is always a compromise among vari uh, variants. Full disclosure, which we talk about a lot, is actually only an approximation. And any disclosure is a mask, which in Greek was a, a persona, which means that it both hides and it shows. And now we're living in a rather strange time of masks where the mask literally protects us from the environment that is from each other. So I create different lingual frames and this is, this is one of those frames, but this is a, a rather tame one of those frames. The kind that I do most of the time requires a kind of instant feedback, a vibratory interaction with what it is that I'm making. And so there's a tuning process involved in the actual, actual sense of what I am becoming in the sense of, of, of what I'm making. For this kind of frame, I tend to invent new terms, new, new ways of pinning down a perspective with a momentary stability, you could say. And that, in theory, protects us from, from preconceptions about what we're saying at that, at that moment. The term that I'm foregrounding here, as I've been foregrounding recently in our conversation, Victoria, is the one called eco proprioception. Now, proprioception, as everybody knows, is a neurological system by which we know ourselves in active movement and environment. Eco proprioception suggests that this physiological system is in vibratory relation with surrounding, and that our our, our knowing ourselves is not an isolated event. This I'd love to hear later on um, what, what Carlo has to say about this relative to the kind of feedback situations that he must be perceiving happening. George, uh, you're, yeah. you, something is disturbing the sound. I don't know what you're oh. happening, but uh, oh. just be careful. Thank you. Mm. Oh, it's your coffee. <laughs> Maybe the coffee, yeah. Um, uh, be careful, thank you. Yeah, okay. So my practice of art is mostly solitary, yet with a high interaction quotient within language and sound itself. And while I perform with others, the, the sense of interaction is always in the moment. That is, it's reconstituting itself, its own identity, its own presence, its own quality of being in the actual moment of its making in a kind of feedback situation. So practice means putting myself in a kind of matrix of interaction involving, in my case, mostly words and sounds, but sometimes things, sometimes objects. So this includes this kind of action here, but this is a milder intensity of action. So what we're really talking about are our, our, our intensities. Conscious action mainly has a, a goal of, of homeostasis among variables with sustained balance. But everything is going out of balance all the time. And imbalance makes noise. And that is necessary noise. Noise is necessary for the manifestation of some manifestation of something that actually has value. To get value, we must experience difference and disruption. That too becomes conscious in art. We upset a stable environment with our poesis. We shock it and get shocked. And that's a shock that awakens. We learn to tune in to the volatile situation, which is creative for self and other. Now, my point is that language contains all of this within itself and how we represent what we do, how we represent the process underway and therefore how we represent what we are in relationship to environment is always a, a process that is a creative interactive process. Language already contains all of this. It already contains, it's never your language, it's never my language, it's always language. So language is always an eco-proprioceptive matrix all by itself. And problem is that whenever we talk to each other, whenever we describe what we're doing, we're creating a further matrix that has an interactive quotient within it, which we don't normally get feedback from. And I, I, 
like quoting David Bohm's statement that the problem with with human beings is that we 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 think in a way that's not eco appropriate and it's not proprioceptive. That is, say, we don't get feedback from our own thinking process. We put it on a screen, put something on a screen, and we're getting feedback from that. But then we posit the thing on the screen as an absolute entity in in itself, as something that actually exists. Actually, it doesn't exist. It's in the process of creation and decreation in that moment. So the problem for me is how do we create language that embodies the situation? How can we actually have our language become proprioceptive? And if that's in relationship to the environment, it's eco-proprioceptive. It's our language. It's our interactive process. So identity true to the environment needs to destabilize itself so that multiplicities can tune into their interactive variables. Paradoxically, being centered in oneself is a state free of fixed identity and more open to otherness. I call this axiality. That's the sort of most used, invented, or reinvented principle that I, that I invoke in, in how I talk about these things. Being free in one's own dynamic axis, tuning, getting in touch with the actual vibratory process of interacting with others at the vibratory level, facilitate, can facilitate the free state itself. And it necessarily means giving up one's own, one's own identity. Anybody, any musician who's who works with improvisation knows that you basically surrender yourself to the process of sound that's happening interactively. And good musicians generally know this a lot better than artists do or, or better than poets do for the most part. So this persona that the Greeks talked about, this process of sounding, this, this what cr actually crosses the mask um, has to learn to become an impersona in a certain sense, it has to learn to become something like an objective process, but it's not there long enough to be objectified in an improvisatory situation. So art is a productive tangle, a, a kind of eco-proprioceptively involvement with entanglement and non-locality. Intensive practice activates an alternate time and vibratory sense, different from the assembly line time that we operate in most of the time. And ECOS is a whole living field, optimally harmonious in self-communicating, self-regulating, self-organizing with unknown criticalities. Poesis art, music, aims to match its potential to heal the interactive field back to itself, which may require interruption and further dislocation. So that's my basic statement for the moment. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated. Um, so the, our next uh, speaker is Nina Weissman to us from Los Angeles. And uh, hold on, Nina, I think you're muted. I should be, do you hear me? Um, there, you go. Yeah. there you go. Wonderful. Um, thank yeah. you so much, Victoria. Yeah, it's so wonderful. <laughs> it's so, I'm having such a great time listening to all of you. There are tons of overlaps, overlaps and excitements and uh, disruptions. So um, I would, uh, let's see, I guess, you, uh, next slide, please. Um, think about this idea from uh, that, uh, Rodolfo Linus, uh, who was the chair of neuroscience and psychology at NYU um, mentioned, which is that mindness is the internalization of movement. So I wanna suggest in this short talk that um, the wiring of the mind happens across our pattern-based senses. My focus these past years has been on working with sound and gesture in hopes of wiring more empathy between bodies and opening minds. Next slide, please. Um, between bodies was a piece I made. I'm gonna show a older piece and a new piece because the connection between them is what I'm thinking about right now. Um, between Bodies uses sound and gestures triggered by those sounds to connect visitors' actions to this piece 
to the energy of bodies living and working in Tijuana, um, with hoping to make visceral any visitors link to the rich networks of people at work in that city. Products, um, products and uh, technologies assembled at great human cost in Tijuana are sold worldwide. Yet for years, media hypes has suggested our only significant connection to this city should be through fear. Internationally, people consume the media's relentless and profitable feed of sensational crime images and stories. And terrified, uh, at the time I made this piece, most residents and non-residents were, non-residents were staying away from the city to the point that the um, economy dropped down to 5% of what it had been. Um, because of the lack of tourists and, and locals were staying home uh, at a time when the violence was in, did not really merit this um, based on um, I had the wonderful opportunity to be guided all around Tijuana. And so I recorded sounds of the everyday life that was actually thriving there. Um, the sounds triggered in between bodies are these samples of everyday gestures, communications um, encountered in the streets of Tijuana. Uh, the reason I did this was, again, to sort of hopefully generate some of these empathies through a few different means. Um, one is this, uh, I wasn't actually thinking explicitly about it, but in hindsight, you could talk about mirror neurons at work here. Um, I'm sure most of you all know, but just for anyone who doesn't, um, the example of how mirror neurons work, simply hearing or seeing um, the sound of, say, if you're a monkey, of another monkey cracking a nut will cause the same muscles in your body to prime as if you were cracking the nut. Uh, and the same, neurons, um, the same neurons are firing as if you're the one doing the action. Uh, so with this in mind, and humans, we do this also, they don't know the precise system, but they see this happening. So with this in mind, the dialogue may be between the real bodies in this piece, and I'll show you a little video and the sounds of bodies recorded in Tijuana might actually create a kind of neural alignment or attunement between the visitor and the people in Tijuana. Um, I was hoping for a kind of embodied virtuality. The neural tape for one activity is in fact played through the visitor while they're not conscious of that. Uh, so next slide, please, little video. If you can thank you start that and there's just a little explanation here of the sensors it's a 70 foot long piece and it's um, through the entrance to the museum so you walk through and you can't help but approach certain sensors and your proximity to them will trigger sound and change of pitch. He's changing the quality of the sound as he moves through it. Oops. You can stop that and go to the next slide. Please. Thank you. It's sort of hard, I think, through the glitching that's going on to get a sense of that. But, but what happens when people move through this piece is they end up just altering their normal ways of moving um, and sometimes dancing with the piece uh, as they sort of align with the activities that they're hearing. Um, so I'm going to jump forward. I mean, the and uh, I guess, let me see, did I move out? I left out a point I wanted to just talk about this cerebral attunement and this um, unconscious empathies and understandings that were generated. And people who came to the piece, it was shown in Orange County, which is a very conservative uh, county here in California, uh, mostly Republicans. And 
um, as they left the piece, they would play in this piece as they left, there was a, a wall sign explaining that the, the sound of a hammer, which was hard for you to discern, but that he's playing with, um, uh, belonged to somebody building, you know, a new shelter there in Tijuana, but the filing sound was someone making a tourist memento out of a coin in order to make that coin valuable because it lost all its value in the economic crash due to this media reporting. So. The other, each of those sounds is there with a, a sort of particular meaning and um, people said to me it, it changed their minds about Tijuana. So that was very rewarding, but mostly what they do is play. And then I think it's a kind of stealth process. Um, so I'm jumping forward now to more recent work where I'm taking this idea of tuning bodies and I'm thinking also about microbes because I'm thinking that we are not doing a very good job on this planet as humans. We are clearly destroying the, um, the, the climate, the ecology, um, whereas the microbes have survived on this planet for three and a half billion years or more without trashing the planet. Um, and so I was thinking maybe by tuning into the microbes, we could learn something valuable. Um, something uh, of the wisdom they've gathered over these three and a half billion years. Um, just to point out another couple of things in the brain that are interested in this regard. Um, if uh, one thing is that, and I decided to explore this through movement. So I worked with dancers with my collaborator, also Flora Wiegman, and we studied very carefully the movements of microbes. Um, we, I was working up at uh, NASA and at SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and I was working closely with that microbiologist and had access to all kinds of unusual microbes we don't usually see. Um, and so we really dug in and worked on, I'll show you a video that will explain this, how they're embodied and so on, um, hoping that simply moving a new way can also rewire the brain. Um, Rodolfo Linus has again pointed out that our creative thinking often happens by, because a new pattern is generated in the brain. And the way that new pattern is generated is by the overlapping of two patterns in our brain. So anytime you're sitting around, patterns of things you've seen, such as these microbes or learned to do, such as walking, are playing in these motor tapes in your brain, in the basal ganglia. Um, so he calls them motor tapes. And those patterns play all the time, not all of them at once, but at a given moment, two or three might be playing. So maybe your tooth toothbrushing pattern is playing along with your walking pattern, along with this weird cross-like form you see in this microbe. And that overlap of patterns literally can lead you to think a new way, can open a new logic. And so I thought, Perhaps if we start to move like these microbes, if we can really take in their embodiment, we'll start to think differently. And the people who are watching us will by mirroring also start to think differently. And we might get some kind of embodied connection and understanding of something that microbes have, are learning or do or know about each other that allows them to survive. So next slide, please. And then you can play that. The driving in question is what is intelligence? How can we think about non-human intelligence from a non-human perspective? Is there any way we can get outside of our human framework to actually somehow sense, taste, perceive the intelligence of another creature? The whole year of 2015, I was artist in residence at the SETI Institute. Can you increase the volume? It's very hard to It's a, a very serious organization. And if you can't, then I'll just... ...allied with NASA. There's just a volume control somewhere. So, I... Hey, Nina. Should I just talk it through? I'll just, yeah. Yeah, because we would try to keep these short. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, let's, so we it just developed a, a long period of research and a long period of exercises with dancers um, 
where we literally took on the sort of um, very liquid, very light, extremely sensitive uh, skin of the microbe and, and develop new ways to sense each other and new ways to move based on that and new ways to socialize um, and new ways to communicate because my, microbes have language. So we built a, a, a way of moving and performed choreography based on that and did that around Los Angeles in different kind of very public settings. So maybe the next slide, quick hop, if you could. I mean, I, uh, if you could just- oh, so stop. Yeah, yeah cool. because we can bring it up and, and send links to people. There's uh, still Anna and John who are presenting. Sorry, great, thank you. Um, that's good. Maybe a closing, uh, a short statement about what you're wanting to discuss with this wonderful group. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this question of tuning in to other people and other creatures is absolutely critical. Um, for us to get through this period and get someplace positive. So that the work is very much about that. And any of the time spent tuning in is uh, simply, uh, it's amazing how, as you all know, just uh, how, how much it can shift your priorities. Um, so i um, very invested in trying to think how to apply that to the problems we're having now. Thanks. I love the idea of tuning in. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to tune in to uh, Anna Nahir, who I have now pleasure of collaborating with. Uh, so Anna, welcome from Slovakia. How wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining. You're muted. Sorry. Thank, okay. thank you so much. And, um, and uh, I have had such a pleasure uh, to, to be able to listen to all that has been already said. and. Um, it is resonating with uh, what I'm doing and what I would like to talk about today briefly. Uh, but first I would like to um, apologize a bit because uh, I'm based in Slovakia now by originally, but originally I hail from Poland and uh, right now we are having massive protests. It's the seventh day of uh, massive protest going on in the streets and what started as a feminist protest against further restrictions of already inhuman abortion law uh, has been transformed into a, I would say the, the bigger protest movement against the authoritarian government. So, uh, you know, part of my head is still with my friends who right now actually might be um, exposed to the sonic weapons, you know, the, the long range acoustic devices that's going to be used for the first time in Poland ever. That was the rumor of the day. So, you know, it also connects to uh, what we're basically, well, what we're discussing here. I mean, uh, the effect of the sound and the frequencies and vibrations and the very materiality of the sound. And this, um, and this, uh, Materiality of the sound is something I would like to talk about a bit, uh, but in a in a more on a more positive note, I would say definitely than than the sonic weapons. But uh, this is just the aspect I think we should be aware of that you know sonic uh, sound is being used as a weapon these days uh, on a on a large scale. So um, so. Um, Yes, I also happen to be a Zen practitioner with the Zen um, Garland Order, uh, Sangha. So I can definitely relate to what Bill Fontana said. And I, I've been always uh, struck by the fact that so many, uh, I would say cons is related to sound as well. And uh, yeah, so uh, one of the, uh, one of the of the uh, uh, poems I, I, I I'm working on uh, right now goes uh, like this: sitting in a room in absolute silence, mind soars unmoved, filled like still water. The striking of thunder has opened the gate of the head's crown. The beginningless self nature has been awakened. So this is actually uh, the poem that is related right in the center of my today's uh, proposition because I would like to uh, uh, discuss with you 
uh, this notion of body-mind. Uh, and it comes from both, fr from my practice as a mu musician and mostly singer, and it relates a bit to my other hat, uh, which is actually, well, I'm, I'm also a scholar uh, specializing in digital culture and cultural studies. So it is a kind of intersection between my practice as a, as a sound artist and, and a musician and also my, my uh, research field. Uh, so, so anyway, I will stick to my um, creative practice today. So this is the project I started uh, with my partner and husband uh, more than 20 years ago. And we've been always interested in um, the opportunities to explore um, the, the sound fields that are being produced by um, the instruments that rarely make it to the traditional Western music. And I don't like to call those these instruments ethnic because it you know immediately relegates them to some kind of a, I would say, uh, well, colonialist thinking in a way as well sometimes. So, so I usually say about non-Western instruments rather than ethnic. So, um, and also I'm interested in this whole fascinating field of electricity. For me, electric guitar is, you know, the device that's capable of actually uh, producing very strong waves and very strong movements uh, also related to my body. So whenever I use my guitar, I usually use over amplify bowed guitar, a treated guitar. And, um, and in this setup, my body actually is a part of this, this whole, um, whole uh, device, this, this whole sound generating machine. That's how I would describe it. Uh, can we have another slide, please? And um, over the years, uh, I think cymatics became quite an uh, important point of reference. And I know that there are other artists uh, who apparently are inspired by this um, esoteric kind of, you know, uh, reflection on the materiality of sound. So what Hans Jenny came up with uh, some time ago actually is quite interesting in terms of um, in terms of what I would like to describe to you um, um, via my voice uh, pra practice. So I'm referring to cinematics uh, only in a very general way, like, you know, um, uh, like uh, the, the, the field of the area of study that's basically interested in um, uh, in, in the material effects that sound have on, um, for example, on, uh, on the tissues, on, on, uh, on a very basic level of the physical structures. That, that's how I would describe it. So I'm not delving into the details too much here. Can we have another slide, please? And since I'm not professionally trained as a musician, I've never been interested in um, traditional um, music based on notation, on, on you know, the necessity to learn scales. It's maybe just me. I've been always interested in the very physicality of the voice working inside of your body. Uh, in, again, here I'm, I've been researching for, for I think more than 10 years now, some of the traditional um, vocal techniques, for example, uh, polyphonic singing from Central so Slovakia, uh, Bulgarian polyphonic singing, which is probably the uh, best known and, and you're familiar to it already, it's uh, quite popular, um, uh, to uh, Sami Yoik, and to some, there's a number of techniques that, that are actually focused uh, on, on how, you know, we can produce sound, how, how, how the human voice uh, is also um, a device to work with the body. So um, I've been interested in embodied, in, in a voice uh, practice and vocal techniques as embodied phenomenon. And from my practice, um, I use my whole body while singing um, from, from the top of my head to the very feet. And over the years, I developed uh, the method and uh, the whole 
um, uh, process that I invite others to. Uh, so I came up with the series of workshops that um, I called those, those, work, those workshops, Reclaim Your Voice. And, um, and I focus on how we can tune in in a group of people without even knowing uh, how to sing. In other words, uh, usually I, I tell people uh, to listen to their own bodies, actually sense their own bodies, to feel their own bodies. And this is actually the way to get to um, using their, their voice in such a way um, so, so, so that um, opens them for the possibilities to go beyond their scales, be beyond their you know, vocal possibilities, even people who are not trained. So can we have another slide, please? Um, so that's how it usually looks like. We work in a close groups around in, 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 in a standing in a circle so that we can feel the resonances from one body to another. So uh, when I heard this uh, wonderful sentence that the person does not hear sound only through the ears, I was immediately reminded about this experience of you know, standing, standing together closely one by another and actually sharing this, um, this vibration that comes from emitting your voice and at the same time making your body uh, resonate. So I developed the techniques that the technique that allows for, for making those resonances more efficient. And, um, and uh, usually in the end, we, as a group, we come up with a, with a wonderful polyphonic singing without uh, ever learning it uh, as, as a musical, you know, um, disciplined practice. It is uh, based on improvisation only. So, so that was the, the work I, I um, I've been um, focusing on for, I think, 15, 20 years now. And part of it made it to the online meditation I was invited uh, by Victoria uh, for, and, and that was a wonderful experience. So I can also relate to, um, uh, to what uh, I think George said about, um, about this interactivity and about um, improvisation uh, as a musician. Uh, whenever you improvise, and especially when you use your own voice, you're always somehow in a space where, where there is no possibility to control everything. You, you have to rely on, on being able to tune in physically with the others, which reminds me about uh, the idea of a Japanese philosopher uh, named Yasuo Yuasa, who uh, came up with... Uh, concepts, two concepts, and, and he wrote a book, uh, The Body, where he writes about the bright consciousness and the dark consciousness. And he's actually interested in um, deconstructing this uh, uh, Western tendency based in uh, uh, Descartes uh, to think about body and mind as a separate um, um, spheres, the separate phenomena. So what he comes up with is this uh, idea of a dark consciousness, which is actually uh, body-mind itself. I mean, something that is related, uh, located in between. And I think the closest um, uh, idea that we could uh, somehow refer to would be some subconsciousness um, as William James uh, uh, proposed it. So it wouldn't be, you know, the Freudian subconsciousness. It would be William James's one. So the the sphere where um, our thinking and uh, our um, our very emotional, our our very um, affective, um, uh, affective um, um, area uh, would be um, grounded in how we move, how we. Um, how we are in our bodies, so to speak. Uh, and actually it is difficult to, difficult to describe this, this phenomenon, this, um, uh, this idea of a mind-body in, in, in the language that's, you know, Western language, language is so, so, uh, so strongly related to this 
uh, Cartesian um, um, uh, polarity, so to speak. So, uh, so, so I find it really interesting that I think this common thread uh, running through uh, almost all of the presentations so far actually is trying to dismantle this, this way of thinking where we have two separate words. One is the intellectual one, another is um, physical or, or bodily uh, uh, one. And, um, and it is so, you know, so encouraging to hear from the scientists that, uh, that uh, the, the hearing, actually the sound permeates um, everything. I mean, the, even the, 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 the very physical, uh, the, even the, um, uh, uh, on a molecular level, actually, we can, we can, we can hear sounds, that, that, that's actually fascinating. So I think that that would be my um, contribution today to, to think about sound as embodied phenomenon. Physically and, and yeah. thank you, Anna. I I feel like you did my job of pulling it all together and making. <laughs> so, we've had that kind of relationship. We never met in person, and we're collaborating online and really thinking about how how strange and yet interesting this time is to be connecting through our voice and video across spaces and time. So we have a uh, half an hour now to talk and uh, somebody, one of you may want to ask another a question or get started on uh, discussing some of the issues that so related to each other. It's a beautiful thread actually, wonderful. I'm tempted just to bring up um... I'll just go back to Linus again for a second because he um, mentions, and I talked to him about it, but in his book that um, single cell irritability might be the seed of subjectivity. So the tendency for a single cell to move towards what it's interested in or away from what it isn't, that that would be the seed of subjectivity. Um, and I had a conversation with him wanting to generalize. He was just talking about neurons, but you see this with all cells. and. Carlo, listening to you, um, your extremely exciting talk about how rhythm can uh, move a stem cell to become a neuron or a heart cell. Um, I was thinking we need to think of this subject to do even at a um, smaller level, like the level of electrons, you know, like rewiring, right? Because I, I, I think it's, uh, there's an artificial distinction. Why would you, why would an electronic um, attraction or repulsion be any different than what we call a higher attraction or repulsion. I think there's a, like, right, I, I, I see them as similar, uh, uh, probably the same material and, and uh, it's, you know, anthropocentrism makes us think our, our way of attracting and repelling is some kind of special. What do you think? Oh, yes. Uh, that's fascinating, the fact that when you go down to the molecule and then you go down to the atom, you go down to energy. You probably, you're dealing with, with fields and the shape of those fields. For instance, uh, even if you think about a magnetic field, the way you can deliver a magnetic field so far was just an antenna or was just uh, related to the issue of uh, uh, frequency, the, the amplitude, the, the amplitude, the waveform, the, the lag, lag phase interval between one wave and the other. Now, if you think about a toroidal shape, then that, that a toroidal dipole is a completely different concept uh, of uh, delivering a magnetic field in space and time. You shrink in the magnetic field in, in the definite sp space and time. And, and the shape that you're creating, it's a, it's a sort of whirlpool effect. And within this whirlpool effect, you're creating synchronization and swarming of vibrational molecules, vibrational entities. So from, from the totally invisible up to the uh, sub, atomic level up to the uh, atomic level and molecular level, there is all a pattern of coherence where the, uh, what you were calling uh, individuality 
uh, is uh, uh, is just merging with the oneness in the in the universe. So uh, we used to say that the human here cannot perceive certain frequencies, but our body can, our molecule can, they can go from zero to whatever. And it is not just a matter of the frequencies, it's a matter of how these frequencies are folding themselves in space and time. This, this is sort of, uh, we, you can call it like, like a new synthetic anatomy uh, that has no limit. And then th this, uh, if you think about uh, genes, uh, about proteins like in hardware, and about this, this other bunch of information, which is much more complex, like, like a software, then uh, th this is setting a new level of freedom, which is not random, it's scale free. It's, uh, it's a different situation where even the, the, the most tough science now is creating evidence for the fact that uh, even in the presence of uh, tough gene mutations uh, or teratogens, uh, still you can have a perfect behavior biology provided that the software is adapting. The software is physics, is this vibration. The hardware is the genome, the proteome, even the epigenetics. Now we're coming out with the, with the idea that uh, uh, all that was uh, sealed in, in, in something which was ancestral uh, is now coming to the future. Uh, it's an ancient going to the future. So uh, uh, ancient rituals, ancient cultures, they perceive the strength of the invisible, the, 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 the idea of vibrating in, the, in this coherent way. Once we lose coherence, then we have disease. And, and, uh, and uh, I think this is a time that uh, even if we have COVID, if we have separation, we cannot hug each other. Uh, probably we can get connected in, an, in another different way, uh, which may turn to be even more stronger. Yeah. This is what I feel. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to work on through movement or embodiment, having, but also using sound. So anyway, thanks so much. Yeah. To, I can make a comment on what you've just talked about. The what I'm calling eco proprioception is basically involves the understanding of ourselves as coterminous with these events. In other words, the consciousness factor, how we actually position ourselves relative to understanding these events, or or observing the events, or participating in the events. Your dance situation um, is very interesting to me in, in, in its attempt to have a kind of mimesis, a kind of embodiment that is taking on the principle of, the, of, an, of a different kind of movement that is not human specifically, or at least not how we conceive of human. But I'm saying that how we conceive of human and how we represent it in our thinking, which is ultimately related to how we represent it in our language, conditions the degree to which we can interact with these events. So working directly through the body the way you do, I, I understand that fairly well because I've been Tai Chi practitioner for several decades and, and I, I practice that as, as a kind of body work as well, in which I entrain to the condition of the, the center of the, of, the, of the other person and surrender my own sense of my own body to to that condition and attract the person in to that in themselves so in a, in a certain sense that principle is the is the interactive principle that allows all of this to become a kind of language and to actually you, you spoke about um being affected and in, in how we think being affected by our engagement through the body with this kind of motion of you know, these principles, these alter, altered, alternate principles of movement that we get. Um, I'm saying that that also has to happen within the language with which we represent it to ourselves. So this is the function of poesis, which is taking the language um, into a different 
a sense of itself, where it becomes proprioceptive. Uh, if we all participate in each other's disciplines a bit more directly, I mean, it's hard for poets because we don't get very many people to spend the kind of conscious time that it takes to get a feel for how these alterations within language alter our thinking, alter our bodies. Because I practice both on the body level and the sound level and, and, and also on, on the language level, I have an opportunity to participate in that kind of interactive process. And I'm getting glimpses of it. So I, I come up with the principle um, simply as a placeholder for this kind of thinking called eco-proprioception, where our, our sense of, of our own movement in time and space becomes consciously interactive with environment in, 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 in all the different levels that you can possibly bring to your attention. So that's, 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 that's what of I'm- Of course, uh, right at that moment, uh, we were joined by John Dulu, who Good. warned us that he would be late, welcome. But I was thinking maybe George, you can do a short introduction to uh, John and then uh, John, maybe you can show us a little bit about your work, uh, a, few, a few minutes to introduce yourself to the rest of the panel. Well, John is, so many things that we need more hyphens than I think we've got available to us today. Uh, John is a, I first knew John as a composer um, of, of new music, of, of music and say the tradition of, of, of John Cage or and, and any number of different um, modern composers, uh, recent, recent work. But he also is a, became a therapist and um, a, um, well, he's a, he's a craniosacral therapist and teacher. He's a naturopath. He's um, a polarity therapist who's, he I had direct involvement with the cymatics of Hans Jenny that was brought up earlier, right? And um, he's worked with uh, many different disciplines simultaneously, mathematics, um, sound installation, um, and many things. And we, we're, we, we collaborate, we play music together uh, also like what we have a thing called the axial band, which attempts to bring this principle as, as a music ha happening in the moment between us. So it's that actual living or alive or in act in activated space between okay. us. Well, welcome John. So good you made it finally. We also published this book of his years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Upside down. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Better upside down, right? No, no, it's good like that. So we have a few slides of yours. Oh, I have slides? Yeah, you sent us something, yeah? I didn't know I did. <laughs> I, I can just... The, I, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody. It's such an honor, an honor to be here with everybody and to hear, yeah, I just got on late, but I already looked at what's, <clears throat> what's happening and, and the idea of the integration. I like to say art informs science and science informs art. Uh, and the fact that we could be here and, and hear scientists talk or hear artists talk and hear them relate to each other. Uh, the world would be a much better place if this could happen more often. And uh, it, it's always happened in my head, but to see it externalized with so many different, you know, qual high quality people is just, is great. Uh, so I, you know, I think I heard the word neural coherence and I'm a doctor, I'm a naturopathic physician and a, a licensed psychologist, been practicing for 50 years. Um, I did, I'm taught at universities and so on. I have all the professional training and also a master's degree in piano performance and so on. Uh, but my interest really these days is in coherence uh, and the application of sound so we could be, oh, I like to say, neurocoherent. The science is there, the research is there, uh, the rest comes down to politics, basically. And my main field is uh, what I call low tech, and because I work with people directly, uh, thousands of patients, and I have to find ways for them to become coherent. And the word coherent 
in I think the modern world just means one of uh, you're centered, an athlete would say they're in the zone. Uh, we would say that in the daily act of living that you have stressors and your ability to adapt to those stressors is what really will lead you to a state of coherence. So the very thing that you resist the most, the very thing that you're scared of the most may be your gateway to coherence. Uh, but when you practice an inner state of coherence, uh, and that could be done through meditation, that could be done through Tai Chi, uh, it could be done through all your movements and dances and arts. Uh, but I found that the use of sound and vibration is one of the most quickest and fastest ways to do it. Uh, and I use basically uh, tuning forks, right? I figure um, it's so simple, everybody knows what they are. And when you have two tuning forks and you use them correctly, uh, you tap them, you can just tap them together. You, you can or just tap like so on your knees, you hold them and I give you the sound. And I started having my patients do this once in the morning for a minute and once at night for a minute. Uh, and then we got into the laboratory. We were able to do some re research on a molecule called nitric oxide, uh, one nitrogen, one oxygen, and how it functions in the immune system, the endothelial and neuronal system. But what we found out most was that it creates a relaxation response uh, that's instant. So if you're, if you essentially, if you're all worried about yourself, if you were thinking, 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 and so on, if you just take for a moment and do this, mm. and you have a good thought, and you can do it. And what's more important is consistency when you do it in the morning and at night for one minute, one minute, and you do it for day after day, month after month. Uh, after a while, it becomes ingrained in you. And then what happens is if something uh, in your life is difficult, like uh, you begin to not get so caught up in it. I like to say when an athlete has a problem but they miss a shot or a musician doesn't play the right note, a good musician just keeps going. They know how to stay coherent. So uh, with my patients, what I want the most for them is to have a good life with a lot of partying and then to be able to come back to coherence over and over again on their own without me. Uh, and when you do that, what happens is your brain becomes nature's drugstore. You will create a cascading of biochemicals that will come over you. And when you're in this coherent state, I think it's been said before, you have the ability, the ability to mindfully listen to your own body and when you listen and listen and listen, you go through layer and layer of what the, the philosophers called qualia. Uh, you begin to go through experience after experience after experience. And all of a sudden you come to a place of deep inner stillness. That would be coherence within coherence. You know, and from that place, uh, your body normalizes. It creates whatever chemicals it needs to heal itself. Uh, and in the time of COVID, we need that for sure, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but basically, once you're in this state, then you come out of this state and you say you want to share it, you want to find a way for other people to come to it. And I think in a way, we've all know this, that's what we're all doing here uh, in our own ways, in our own unique creative ways. And that's why I say it's such an honor to be here with everybody, because there's so many roads into this state uh, and there's so many ways to, to come to it. Uh, and the more we have in sharing it with ourselves and others, the better. So, uh, and my job at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be 73, 70, pretty soon 74. I'm here to give it away. <laughs> I figure that uh, we're all vibrational beings, um, you know, and what we need more in the world is just to have our own, I call it self-regulation. So now we're messed up, we know how to self-regulate. Um, and when we can self-regulate, we come back in tune, we're in tune, our body is doing what it needs to do. Uh, we can measure this and quantify it, all the better. Uh, but I, 
I don't know how much quantification you need. You can quantify and quantify, but you also have to have the direct experience. Uh, yeah. You have to have the dance. You have to have the movement. You have to have the art. You have to, you have to embody, as George would say, you must embody it. Without embodying it, you know, it's all up in your head. It sounds good. And, and, and believe me, it's, it's, a, it's a fun to think about it intellectually, uh, but ultimately, uh, you, when you're in resonance, your mind and your body both live it. Uh, so I like to talk about it, but I like to live it too. That's so right. yeah, so, that's, what, that's what I have to say to everybody. <laughs> I think it's what everybody's saying anyway. So. No, it's, it's really actually beautiful how everybody's actually saying the same thing in a different yep. way from a different angle. And I would like to just uh, talk a little bit about how we deal with destructive frequencies, noises, acoustics, sounds, both from uh, media bombardment to actual sonic warfare that Anna was mentioning, because it's, it's really overwhelming. And I uh, actually, I talked to Carla a little bit about this Mental illness is on the rise because of everybody being quarantined, having many, many issues on top of it, but also the noise and how, how to teach or relate or connect to a large collective about the possibility of coherence and the shift to a different way or to have some sense of empowerment in this time. I think is really the work that needs to be done and it has to be done from a group of people like in this um, Zoom call. So uh, I would really like to hear a few thoughts about this from anyone that feels compelled to answer. Uh, can I say something? I'm oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to mention, you know, Sorry, people were talking a bit. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> Yeah, my name is uh, Jim Jimzewski, and I am a professor at UCLA, work in nanotechnology and uh, sort of nanomedicine. Um, and I know some of you, I know George and Carlo there. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that, that the Scottish have used um, sound as a instrument of war for a long time. So the bagpipes uh, are actually classified as a war instrument and they were designed, the, the sounds, you know, when they uh, went into war, uh, put terror in the uh, enemy. And actually in the Second World War, there was a thousand pipers died, you know, because they would lead, they would lead the, the Scottish regiments into battle. And they were also made illegal in the late, I think, at middle 1700s after the uprising. Um, and people actually had to hide them. You could be uh, thrown in jail if you were caught with bagpipes. So that's one instrument of war. And the other thing I was reading is uh, in Switzerland, um, they had a, a yodeling contest and it turned out the yodeling causes the COVID to fly long distances. And it was a super spreader event. And they traced some 2,000 people got COVID from the yodeling contest, the audience. Anyway, that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my input. Okay. Thank you for that Scottish input. <laughs> so now we know about uh, sonic warfare actually happening for a while. <laughs> Anna, do talk. I just want to mention the fact that actually in, in, in the Carpathians in Europe, during the Second World War in Poland, the long trumpets have been forbidden because, uh, because the, the Nazis um, uh, got to know, they learned that actually the mountaineers um, used those long horns to signal as you know, the signaling instrument. So it was a kind of a not, maybe not a warfare uh, in a direct sense, but a kind of, you know, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the resistance system. So I think it is widespread, probably among the mountaineers because in you know, Scottish bagpipes and Scotland is also a mountain country. So that would be my remark. Very nice. But how do we have a response to this uh, 
sonic attack, I guess, is my question. Is there any thoughts about that? I want to, it's something I work with. The government approached me, often approaches me for information. And, but basically, if you, it's, what is a sonic attack? I mean, you know, if, if for example, people tell me when they hear Guns N' Roses, it's a sonic attack. Uh, or they hear rock music, it's a sonic attack. Uh, I've actually had people use that language. So a lot of it has to do with your ability to listen. Uh, John Cage said that all sounds are music. You know, it's just how you, know, how you listen to them. Uh, for example, one of the things I enjoy most when I'm in an airport traveling and I hear the beep, beep, beep of the machine coming by, I'll be meditating. It goes beep, beep, beep like that. And a lot of people next to me are all tightening like this and uh, they're, they're saying how horrible this is. We want to get rid of this sound. Whereas I just actually realize it's there. It activates the amygdala. It says, wake up, they don't want the truck to run over you. Then you realize, no, I'm safe. So I go back and I meditate and I go beep, beep, beep. And I use it as a mantra. Uh, and then if I follow that sound, it takes me to all kinds of other realities and places that are quite wonderful. Uh, same with car horns honking and so on. So what's noise to one person can be music to another. It just depends on, on how you listen. Uh, you know, if I've been to hospital, by the way, and somebody's really sick, I'm not gonna use car horns to heal them. So you understand this is a, if, or if I'm teaching yoga, I don't wanna make somebody touch their toes if they can't, but they can only get to their knees. But your ears stretch just like your body stretches. So. But there's why. definitely uh, frequencies that are destructive. Uh, Anna, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to say something about actually actually listening because you know, as a person who often gets uh, heart palpitation when there is certain type of frequencies are occurring around me, I can tell that for you know, for me, listening actually is uh, very embodied practice. So I think it is not only about, uh, of course, it is not about uh, the volume. It is also about the frequency. It's about the way this, this sound works physically inside of your body. So what I wanted to say is that, you know, uh, I think that maybe the practice of listening uh, to inside of your body, to, to, to the sounds that normally not even uh, perceptible, like, you know, the beating of the heart and, and, and the, the blow the, the blood uh, flows, uh, which actually quite often happens during the meditation. So this is, for me, this is, you know, uh, the, the, the interface, the, the, the space where meditation and the sound practice uh, sort of, you know, uh, overlaps. So, so I would say that maybe we could come up with some ideas about how to develop this listening uh, as, you know, something that hap that's happening inside of your body, not necessarily with your ears, as Carla has said. But that would be my three cents about it. So Carla, uh, in your research with cell as in relation to light and sound and healing, do you find that there are also destructive uh, sounds, uh, frequencies that can actually uh, impact our physical health in a negative way, so not even conscious mind, but uh, sounds that are destructive? Uh, I have no direct experience on that uh, because we're looking at, at the opposite usually. We're looking at sound that can, can make everything coherent. I, if I can make you hearing this, this sound, if I succeed, Oh, okay, so let's, you can, you should try sharing. Could you hear it? A little bit, but I'm not sure if it was broken up or if it was, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Inside our heart, we have this micro rhythm. And our people uh, were able with meditation to perceive these subtle vibrations. That was the, the work that Milford has done. So all the percussions, all the ancient rhythms uh, that 
comes uh, from spontaneous improvisation in music are so important because they are somehow the extrinsication of the this subtle vibrations, the subtle micro rhythms within the, the sound of the heartbeat. So uh, when an, an embryo, for instance, uh, she or he can listen to the sound of the mother's heart. And then, uh, uh, so we are embedded in the sound of the heart. So this, this motion, this, uh, this vibration is one of the most complex and most harmonic that we may have. And uh, learning how to, to make music from the sound of the heart is, uh, is one of the most important hidden treasures that uh, ancient traditions has has brought over time. All the ritualism from the ancient uh, rhythms from, from Africa, from Congo, are so important. They are almost uh, lost. One, one of the most important job the Milford Graves has done is, is just uh, working and uh, recuperating all this, these treasures. And, uh, and so I, I think that uh, uh, Thinking about the sound of the heart is something that everybody can, can do. And uh, just thinking that uh, through the heart, uh, each single cell in our body is, is resonating, it can, create, it can create harmony. And um, I think this is really sort of miracle. Uh, we don't think of that so much, but uh, the, the heart really entails uh, a wonderful uh, symphony and melodies of many, many rhythms. Mm. And also, uh, the field that heart is generating, this, this huge magnetic field, which is connecting people. We are uh, embedded within the mag magnetic toroid, which is generated by our own heart. And it is now proven that uh, when, when people love each other, the people are... Uh, prone to share deeply their soul, their own experiences, uh, then the story becomes one. In a room, you can see this uh, enlargement of the, of the magnetic field of the heart and embracing many people. This has been done uh, uh, by, by the end of squids and magnetometers. Uh, it has been done in a mapping of the, the field generated by the heart. And so, uh, uh, it's like saying that the, the, our heart knows how to make music. And this is one of the most important uh, healing sound that we have inside our biology. And the work you've done with Milton Graves is really fantastic. We'll share it with everybody. And this is such a nice way to end our meeting, to think of the mind, heart, and the uh, field of this heart vibration. Thank you so much. Nina had to leave a little early because of uh, another meeting, but she also will be in touch and we'll be all in touch because this is something that I'm very passionate about. I think sound, acoustics, coherence is really the key to what we are having to work with right now. And I so appreciate knowing you all. And I hope that we're going to do something together again. So this is to me a beginning. And thank you so much to everybody. Until next time. And thank you to the audience who was here and um, those who will be here in the future watching this recording. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.